Crowley's hatred for Christianity was so intense, he often referred to himself as the Beast of the Apocalypse from the Book of Revelation. He was a Freemason and a Rosicrucian who made Do What Thou Wilt famous through the 20th century, with followers like L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology, Harvard professor and drug guru Timothy Leary, and even Beatles founder John Lennon. Crowley is often credited with sparking the 1960s cultural revolution, the do-your-own-thing mentality dedicated to sex, drugs, and rock and roll. What could be called the modern legacy of men like Franklin, Dashwood, and the Hellfire Club. But wait a minute. Obviously, it cannot be said that Franklin's involvement with the Hellfire Club is to be fully equated with the often crazed activities of a man like Crowley or even Timothy Leary. Still, one must wonder what Franklin was doing with a group of immoral aristocrats who dabbled in devil worship, even if they were just kidding around as some have suggested. Is it likely that this legendary founder of America, the man who discovered electricity, invented the bifocals, and co-authored the Declaration of Independence, simply spent his time in England getting drunk and seducing women? Franklin was known to be a crafty fellow. Could his dealings with Dashwood and the Hellfire Club have somehow been a part of a greater agenda? After all, Sir Francis Dashwood was no ordinary drunken rake. He also happened to be a member of the British Parliament and was a close friend and advisor to King George III, the man the American colonists would rebel against. The Hellfire Club itself were made up of English nobility, some of whom held high offices in the King's government. Was it mere coincidence that these men, close friends of Franklin, just happened to be in power when the British were defeated? In his book, The Occult Conspiracy, author Michael Howard chronicles how Benjamin Franklin came to England in 1758 to discuss the future of the American colonies with Sir Francis Dashwood. Meanwhile, British historian Richard Deacon, in his History of the British Secret Service, claims that Dashwood's Hellfire Club functioned as a center of English espionage. Because of Franklin's many clandestine activities, some involving a British double agent named Edward Bancroft, Deacon and fellow historian Professor Cecil B. Curry speculate that Ben Franklin may have been a covert spy for the British government, known either as Number 72 or with the code name Moses. But was Franklin working for the British? Or were secret powers within the King's own government working with Franklin for the ancient plan of all secret societies, the New Atlantis. Why would British intelligence refer to Benjamin Franklin as Moses? Normally, enemies are given names like Carlos the Jackal or the Butcher of Baghdad. But Moses? Was the name itself a kind of cipher or secret code? Had they already determined that as Moses led the children of Israel from the bondage of Egypt, so Franklin would lead the American colonies to freedom from King George. Could this be why Benjamin Franklin's initial design for the Great Seal of the United States was that of Moses standing on the shoreline of the Red Sea as the waters destroyed Pharaoh and his army, with the motto, Rebellion to Tyrants is Obedience to God. Coincidence? Maybe. Yet in his book, America's Secret Destiny, author Robert Hieronymus, whose doctrinal thesis on the reverse of the Great Seal has been used by the White House, the State Department, and the Department of the Interior, makes the comment that Franklin's design for the seal represented, quote, how he viewed America's birth and destiny. Did Franklin really see himself as Moses? 
defeating King George, the colonial pharaoh, with the help of Dashwood and the Hellfire Club. An alarming theory. But for British intelligence to undermine King George on behalf of a secret agenda should not be terribly surprising, at least not to the modern American. Consider the conflict between President John F. Kennedy and the CIA during the Bay of Pigs invasion. The CIA reportedly lied to the president on behalf of their secret agenda involving an assassination attempt on Fidel Castro, something that would later lead to the Cuban Missile Crisis. JFK was so surprised at their power, believing it to be a threat to the American people, he vowed to shatter the CIA into a thousand pieces. Or what about the Iran-Contra affair, where President Ronald Reagan stated emphatically that the U.S. was not providing arms to Iran in exchange for hostages being held by pro-Iranian terror groups? In spite of the wildly speculative and false stories about arms for hostages and alleged ransom payments, we did not, repeat, did not trade weapons or anything else for hostages. But Reagan soon returned with an apology once he learned that, yes, the U.S. was illegally selling arms to Iran, an enemy country. The profits from the sales were then being used to finance a secret CIA operation involving the Contras in Nicaragua. As with JFK, Reagan claimed that he had been manipulated and lied to by secret powers within the intelligence community. It's going on that had been kept from me in various covert Mr. operations. President, did they deceive you? We didn't answer whether Poindexter and North deceived you. Presidents Reagan and Kennedy were humiliated at being the most powerful men in the world who were unaware of what the hidden powers in their own government were up to. Well, at least in the case of Kennedy. It was later revealed that President Reagan knew more about the covert actions of the intelligence community than he had let on. After all, his vice president, George Bush Sr., was the former head of the CIA and a member of an elite secret society known as the Skull and Bones. Some find it interesting that while in office, President Reagan was made an honorary 33rd degree Mason. Since then, America's presidents have all been members of secret orders, including Skull and Bonesman George W. Bush, whose war on terror is said by some to have sparked the beginnings of World War III. Bush claimed it was the CIA who provided the information about weapons of mass destruction that ultimately led to the war in Iraq. As of the making of this documentary, that information has turned out to be false. An intelligence error? Maybe. Or perhaps the same powers that were working in the days of Benjamin Franklin have never really ceased to function. Is it just a coincidence that the war on terror has provided the opportunity to spread democracy to all the world? And this is what people don't understand, is, as our president talks about how we want to bring democracy to all these countries of the world. Well, why doesn't he want to bring a republic to these countries? We were a republic. We were never a democracy. It is only the people from the mystery religions and the secret societies who are pushing this idea of world democracy or this combination of enlightened nations, enlightened democracies to rule the world. As incredible as it may seem, there are really people who believe that. They're working full-time to accomplish that goal. And until you understand that they are the primary force behind the wars of this last century and World War III, which we are entering into today, unless they understand that the whole idea is uh, to create this reestablishment of what they believe is lost Atlantis, this wonderful utopian society that they believe existed uh, eons ago. Anybody who studied the history of America knows we were not established as a democracy. Our founding fathers didn't believe in democracy. They wanted a republic, a government of law, not uh, the de democracy, which is what the secret societies have been working for for well over 3,000 years. Could this be the secret behind what's happening in the world today? 
And was this the underlying motive in the war for American independence? To wrestle the new world from the power of the old, that it might in time be used to bring forth the great Atlantean plan envisioned by Sir Francis Bacon. Benjamin Franklin certainly knew the works of Francis Bacon and all the ethics and things that he was uh, trying to establish. Bacon was a man that Benjamin Franklin had much in common with. Both men were the leading scientists of their time. Both men were involved in printing, and both men published works that helped to transform the people of their generation. Both men developed their own system of ciphers and secret codes, which they used for intelligence purposes during wartime. And both men were deeply involved in the Masonic and Rosicrucian movements of their day. Franklin was a member of Masonic and secret orders in America, in England, and in France, the three countries involved in the American Revolution. But some researchers argue that his influence in France truly demonstrates his loyalty to a plan that looked beyond America, to a global revolution. He was the master of the uh, uh, Lodge of the Nine Sisters, Nelchoir, the Lodge of the Nine Sisters right in Paris, and that's where the revolution started instantly. So he was lodge master there every time he visited the place. He, as so many young people, very intelligent people, really believed that man could create a better society without being totally reliant upon God. And of course, we know that he eventually he went to France, and he was when he was in France as the American ambassador to France, uh, he was instrumental in pushing these ideas that led to the French Revolution. Franklin went to France to convince King Louis the Sixteenth to finance the American Revolution. But in the process, Franklin was preaching radical ideas that would later on inspire the French to overthrow Louis, the very monarch who had helped to pay for the founding of America. Americans desperately needed money to fight the War of Independence because, according to Franklin, England had ruined their economy to keep America from becoming too prosperous. When he was ambassador to England, um, the Bank of England said, how come America, the, the representatives of the Bank of England said, how come America is getting so rich? And Franklin, say, in his autobiography, recounts the story. He said, well, that's easy. In America, we create our own money and we owe no interest to pay to no one. Uh, so the Bank of England said, oh, that's very interesting. So they immediately had passed through Parliament the Currency Act of 1764. And what did the Currency Act do? It outlawed uh, the creation of America's own money and made um, put America on the gold standard, made Americans pay their taxes in gold or silver coin, which, of course, was very scarce in the American colonies in those days. So what was the result? It, it immediately plunged America into a deep depression. Franklin says that this, this depression, and uh, uh, everyone in America was well aware of what the depression, who caused the depression, why it was caused, just because England outlawed America just simply printing its own money, and that it was this uh, Currency Act of 1764 that was really the root cause of the American Revolution, because it caused uh, so much unemployment and uh, uh, a terrible economic upheaval. And Franklin's quote is, we could have endured a little tax on tea and other matters, but it was England's taking away our ability to create our own currency that was really the root cause of the revolution. And so King Louis supported the American cause through financial aid and the use of troops. But some years later, many of the French soldiers who fought for America would return to France to fight the French Revolution. Among their leaders would be an American hero, the Marquis de Lafayette, who served alongside George Washington. Lafayette was also a Freemason and close acquaintance of Benjamin Franklin, the man who seemed to be the friend of nearly all the revolutionaries of the day. It was Benjamin Franklin who initiated Voltaire himself uh, in 1778. He could then brag and say, well, Voltaire was a Mason. Ooh. People would say, if it's good enough for him, it must be good enough for me. I don't know what it's all about, but it sounds like a good thing. 
While the writings of Voltaire inspired the French revolutionaries, Americans were compelled by another of Franklin's close friends, Thomas Paine.